Hi, I'm Audrey the Crochet, and I am here with the Cyborg himself, uh, one of the stars of The Purge. Well, the first Purge, which is, uh, whew, if you haven't seen that movie, please go see it. Um, and pronounce it for me one more time, because I'm going to make sure everybody knows in your accent how to pronounce your name. Yes, perfect. So it's Javan Wade. I often say it's like Japan with a V. Um, because I've had this whole thing where people say Javon and it's not Javon. And then I say, okay, well, say Japan. And then they say Japan. And then they say Javon. Okay, well, no, just now swap the P with the V. Javan. There we go. Javan Wade. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's, such, it's such a great name, though, because when you look at it, like I instantly go, oh, Joy. Oh, that's cool. Like it's, it's like a, it's already a part of your name. And it's so interesting because that's, it's kind of how I feel about how your career trajectory has gone, right? Because mm -hmm. you, you're now starring as Cyborg. Um, you were originally, uh, I don't know if people have guessed, uh, from the UK. Uh, mm -hmm. Most people yep. have not heard this accent. <laughs> <laughs> surprise, <laughs> surprise. <laughs> uh, but, you, but you do have a, a, really, a really cool following that started off because you started off as a YouTuber. Um, mm -hmm. And... and that's actually a misnomer. Like you've had a very interesting career where you decided that you wanted to do acting and be a performer. And talk to me a little bit about how your YouTube show came about and what was the motivation behind it for folks who may not know that story. Yeah, for sure. So I, I actually started off playing uh, football, what you guys know as soccer. And that was kind of, you know, the, the be and end all for me. I very quickly realized that it was something I was good at and something, and something that I didn't actually love. And so I wanted to pursue mm -hmm. a career in acting. And so um, I ended up going to a place called the Brit School. I remember speaking to my mate and I said to him, look, I want to be an actor. He was, he was at football training. He's like, okay, well, you have to go to the Brit School. I was like, okay, cool. What's the Brit School? He's like, Adele went there, Amy Winehouse. He's like, if you want to be, you know, famous, if people want to know who you are, you have to go to the school. I was like, okay, cool. I went, I, I applied for the school, went there and um, studied for two years. And I just realized that at the end of those two years that I was either going to go into a world where I was going to study for another three years and, you know, go to another traditional drama school like RAD or, or Aura or Lambda. Mm -hmm. um, but I just kind of felt like I've just received this training at a very young age, which is equivalent to what I would get in drama school. Let me just kind of get into the world now and start. And so I ended up launching a, an online comedy series, which is called Mandem on the Wall. Jamaican Patois, Mandem means basically a group of guys that are together. Um, you, the inspiration was almost like, uh, I think like Friday, a group of guys who sat on a wall in an estate, you know, projects in South London. And it was like our everyday lives and using flashbacks and touching on subjects in which we wanted to talk about, but in a comedic way. That show went out online and the first episode was about the London riots, ended up doing hundreds of thousands of views overnight. And then mm -hmm. after four episodes, we were picked up by Channel 4 in the UK to make it into a TV show. And at that point, the, the, the career trajectory took place and um, I was working on different shows, then did a sketch show for the BBC and I was officially yeah. into the industry. So yeah, that was the kind of opening for me. Which is kind of interesting too, because you started off saying like you wanted to be a footballer, which is, which my beautiful segue to this is that it was very similar to another actor we've had uh, at Ace Comic Con in Chicago, Matt Smith, who also was on another show that you were on. I don't know if <laughs> yeah. folks know that Matt Smith was a doctor uh, for <laughs> Doctor Who. And you really had your first kind of breakout role on Doctor mm -hmm. Who. And like people stand like your character hard mm -hmm. uh, from those two episodes in 2014. Like how did one, like how does it even feel to be on probably, well, it still is the longest running sci-fi show in history, but like such a like legacy franchise as kind of your breakout mm. TV role? It was a dream come true, to be honest. I think, you know, a big thing for me is, has always been creating my own opportunities to be able to put myself in a position that I can do what I want. So I always say, you know, do what you have to do so you can do what you want to do. And I wanted to be in a position where I was able to be a part of these amazing shows like Doctor Who and, um, for me, it was a, a real statement. It was an opportunity for me to say, look, you know, as as a, a black actor who's come from, you know, South London to trying to, first of all, just say, I want to act, which isn't isn't and wasn't common back then. It was like, you know, you're either going to be a rapper, you're going to be a football player, or you're going to go to prison. You know, that those were the three statistics. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, okay, well, 
being in a position where I could be in such a huge show as Doctor Who, with such a huge fan uh, fan base. Shout out to the Whovians. Um, you know, it was a, it was a dream come true, and playing a character in which I wasn't cast for, you know. Uh, some kind of stereotypical role and it was in a world, a sci-fi world, which was the first ever sci-fi project that I'd done. And to be doing the first ever world, uh, project in that world being, you know, the biggest show in the UK was like, it was a dream come true. And not only that, but to do it one episode and then, you know, the, the, the fan base loving that character so much that they decided to bring back that character was like, thank you, thank you, you know? So I can't even, the joy, that, that I get from being a part of that world. And even down to now, I still kind of feel like, you know, the Whovians are some of the biggest fans in the world. I, I, I received more letters than I could have ever imagined. And still to this day, have those guys championing me for all of the other projects and naturally them being a part of a lot of the other sci-fi projects in which I have done. So um, yeah, the fan base kind of transcends and it, it was a beautiful opportunity. I mean, as a Whovian, since I was nine years old, I can confirm uh, everything you just said. <laughs> um, uh, thank you, PBS. Uh, but, you know, after this, like, and you've spoken about this a number of times in interviews, you've done uh, videos on your own YouTube channel, kind of talking about this decision about making a transition over to Hollywood and like this idea of if I really want to do this, if I really want to like make this next step in my career, this is where. I've got to be. So like, what does that even look like? Like that's, that's, that's not just like hopping to New York. That's like hopping past New York and be like, Cali is it. So what does that look like for you after kind of this breakout role? Yeah, for me, it was after I'd done uh, Doctor Who, I kind of just felt like, okay, what's next? What's the, what's the, I'm always looking for myself at how can I ascend? How can I take the next big opportunity and move forward? And I just felt like after doing that show, there wasn't going to be too many more projects or too many more shows in the UK that I felt like would have been taking me up a level. And so I felt, you know, if I want to be this global star and I want to be able to, you know, tell stories to the world, then I have to go to and I have to be a part of, you know, the biggest uh, consumer filmmaking platform in the world, which is Hollywood. And so 2016, I had a conversation with my agent and said, look, I want to go to the US. I want to, you know, try and crack Hollywood and get into those doors. And he said, okay, well, let's do it. And my first trip out 2016 summer, I spent, you know, meeting a bunch of different managers and trying to kind of build a team out here. And I ended up signing with Atlas Artists, who are my managers I, I, I know and love dearly. And that opportunity was like, okay, cool. Now we're here. Now let's just start meeting. And I just, I, I remember doing about countless meetings that I took from the year of 2016 to 2017, of which one of those meetings was with a casting director in which ended up giving me an audition to do my audition for the first purge known as Island Experiment previously. And so that then, you know, was the big trajectory into me coming and I was going back and forth, still working with my company and building my company in the UK while taking mini trips, three weeks, four weeks, a month, six months um, at a time to try and build that trajectory and then ended up getting that audition while I was still in the UK on the back and forth to be able to then land in my first Hollywood blockbuster being the first purge. So yeah, that was that kind of that transition. And it's, it was difficult, but I also wanted to make sure that I had set things up and wanted to have a foundation before coming out. And, and I would say that the plan worked perfectly and, and here we are today. Yeah, no, I mean, and for those people who are horror fans and who are fans of The Purge, I am fan, I am a fan. Although like sometimes The Purge is hard to watch. <laughs> like, yep. I mean, it's hard because there are, particularly in the first purge, that were so many underlying socioeconomic things that hit so close to home, like mm. uh, particularly when it comes to government and how, how you experiment on communities who don't have any other say in it and what does it mean to bring outside agitators in. And your character in the purge really gets like caught up. Um, yeah. But one of the things I love about this, and I'm going to go back to it again, is your accent. And we're going to go back to when we get to Cyborg, because if anybody has watched your stuff, you actually have different American accents. They're not just like one American accent that you use. And that's, you know, eh, that takes a little bit. But I hear there's a, there's a story about how some of your co-stars didn't know <laughs> that you yeah. weren't American. Yep, Talk to yep. me about this. And how do you maintain that? for the full length of a movie. 
So it's for me, I love to, you know, you have different styles of acting. You have, you know, your your method acting and you have people in which are, are will apply themselves to a role only when they're on set or some people that will even take it home, you know. And for me, I kind of marry in, in, in I dabble in the middle of that. And so when it comes to accent work and I'm playing a character in which demands an accent, I feel like my personal process, I need to live in that accent for the duration of the project in order to really kind of, you know, cement myself, especially early on in my career. And as you know, the first purge was the first project that I'd done with an American accent. And so it was about me really trying to just stay in that world. And so when it came to, you know, the first purge even, and also Doom Patrol, staying in that accent, I would turn up to work, you know, even now when I, when I'm playing Cyborg, I come into work and the first thing that you get, which is, you know, everything's waiting for you in your trailer. Do you need anything, et cetera? I reply, in an American accent. There's even been times where as I'm about to get to work, I'm on the phone having conversations with my business partner and the last kind of 20 minutes of that conversation, I'm talking in an American accent because I'm about to get to work. And so even you know, from when I'm on set to when I'm eating lunch, that whole process, that whole day, I'm in an American accent. So you would never know that I'm British unless you see me outside of work which is you know in my downtime and that is you know only crew members in which you end up clicking with and end up you know having a friendship with outside of work get to see that so yeah i remember rap day uh, on the purge and also on doom patrol where at the end of it it was like yes we rapped and so i can completely lose the character and just be <laughs> myself and i'm then at the end you know going up to everyone from being an American in the purge and like, yeah, come on, man, this is, this was crazy, man. Like, I really appreciate what you was doing. And like, I mean, my New York accent and then shift into mate, absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for that. And, you know, and they're, and they're looking at me and they're like, hold on a minute, because they felt like they had experienced a whole different person. An accent is such a big part of, you know, what makes up a person. And so being uh, in that accent and also the mannerisms that take place from, you know, embodying that accent and an American, so yeah, I, I upset a few people and uh, they felt like they knew me. I'm, look, I'm the same guy. Everything's the same. It's literally just the way that I'm speaking. And um, yeah, and I also gained a few fans and, you know, people were like, look, I, I had no idea. And, you know, uh, kudos to that performance and to you kind of maintaining that. But yeah, I, I, I just stay in it because it just helps my process and my performance as an actor. Yeah. And wait, I, I personally, for me, like, even though I knew you were from the UK, like it wasn't until I heard your first interview that I was like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, <laughs> well, that is, a, yeah. it, it, it does feel like a completely different person. And I think it's mm. really interesting. I wanna make a little bit of a switch to Doom Patrol because I know everybody is watching right now, like, when are you gonna ask about Victor Stone? When is this gonna happen? <laughs> yes, here we go. So primary question, I gotta know, were you a comic book fan before you landed yourself inside the DC universe? Indeed. I, I'm, I'm a huge comic book fan, always have been. Um, I think as a child, for me anyway, it was superheroes are your escape. Superheroes is what you mm -hmm. feel like allows you to be able to achieve and to do anything, whether it be pertaining to, you know, your acting career or everyone being a superhero in their own right, in their own universe, mm -hmm. as you will, and whatever it is that they do. And so I was a huge fan of, you know, superheroes, period, across the two universes, across Marvel, across DC, and, you know, having a relationship with superheroes from a very young age, you know, dressing up as, uh, you know, cy a cyborg or as Spider-Man or, you know, any of these different characters in which you relate to from a young age. And, even as a as an actor, one of my biggest wants was I really want to play a superhero, which is actually also uh, part of my strategy as to why I signed to Atlas Artists, knowing that Atlas Entertainment made the DC movies, etc. I was like, okay, cool. If you want to be in that room, then you know you've you, you've got to be in that building, and so I wanted to try and do that. But yeah, comic books was always a big, big, big thing for me, and. I've always had dreams and aspirations of playing a superhero and playing, you know, uh, the, if not one of the biggest um, superheroes in the DC universe, let alone black superheroes is, is iconic and, and, and a real opportunity for me. So yeah, every day I wake up, I'm still dreaming. I can't, I can't help it. It's, it's a dream. Well, you make such a, uh, you make such a, a good point um, is that this is a really big, like this character was a really big deal for a lot of people of color, right? And you are literally one of a very few people who have ever played this character in live action. So mm -hmm. for you, as you're developing out Cyborg, particularly in this very bizarre 
very bizarre um, show, which I love. I say bizarre in the most affectionate way possible. Um, yeah. What do you, what was your kind of developing out of this character? Like, what do you think is unique about your depiction of Vic Stone versus what you've seen in live action or animated depictions? Mm -hmm. So for me, my process was, um, first of all, looking at what I loved about the character from a personal mm -hmm. standpoint. I think when you come into a character that already exists, it's a whole different world to playing a character in which you're able to create and ideate from the ground up. I, I have so many different reference points, which is a great thing, but then also at the same time, there's so much expectation and there's so much, uh, you know, opinions about what that character should be. And so my my biggest thing was the, you know, well, in the UK Cartoon Network 2000 version of Cyborg in Teen Titans. I love that version of the character, how funny was, you know, how 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 big that character was, but at the same time, the, the relationship that you could get with that character and how you felt like you knew him and just the marry between Vic Stone and Cyborg. I felt like even mm. with that cartoon version, you would look at Cyborg and although you would see so much cybernetic, he just felt like just, you know, a, a young guy in which was just like me and, and, you know, any of the other young black guys I grew up with. But the only difference was he had that cybernetic. And so for me, it was about how do I marry that? How do I take Vic Stone mm and marry that with Cyborg, but still having Vic Stone at the forefront, as opposed to it feeling like, you know, focusing on the cybernetic version, which is what I felt like they had done in other versions, like the Justice League. And so yeah. wanting to just create a, a different version that I felt like the audience would relate to. And I want you to look at this guy who's wearing track suits in the same way, you know, sweatsuits in the same way that I do. Sneakers from, you know, the best sneakers, the best Jordans, the best Adidas kicks, the best Nikes and um, yeah. be in a place where you just can relate to that character. And so I, I, I read all the comic books um, that I hadn't already read that pertain to Cyborg, whether it be Teen Titans or the Justice League, or just, you know, Cyborg Reborn or any any of these specific comics, and then watch back all of the Teen Titans, watch everything that had been in live action and just kind of took apart all the pieces that I loved about those renditions, as well as what I would have loved to see. And that's how I kind of came to the conclusion of the Vic Stone in which you see in the Doom Patrol. Which is actually interesting because like when you think of every character in the show, like everyone is uniquely crafted, right? Like Crazy Jane's got her wardrobe, Robot Man is Robot Man. Uh, you know, it Elastigirl has her her own situation where she's probably gotta deal with a lot of CGI work in, in what she does. Negative man is in raps. Like it, it like it, it's all these things that are going on, right? But there is a number of prosthetics that you personally have to wear for this show to pull this off when you're talking about these cybernetics. Yeah. I gotta know, what does a day in a life look like you're getting ready to put everything on underneath these track suits? Mm -hmm. So it usually starts off with my hair, being that um, we have a prosthetic in which is uh, glued to my face, which has the magnets inside of that mask which allows the mask to be able to clip onto my face. And so that Word. basically gets, yeah. So that gets glued to my head. And uh, in order to do that, my head has to be, my hair has to be at a certain length for that mask to work. So getting in, getting my hair cut, which usually takes around 35 minutes to 40 minutes. After I've done that, I usually go and see Alex, um, who deals with all of my costume um, and my faceplate. And then we apply the, uh, what we call as the, the gasket, uh, onto my face and that basically is applied with uh, yeah makeup glue and it's then stuck in and, and kind of laid and measured in a specific method um, and it's so specific because the eye so I can't actually see out of that eye right out of my left eye and so because of that I'm in a position where it has to line up in a certain way so any literally you know half an inch three uh, three inches of an inch whatever it is if that is off then I either can't see or it's in my eye or whatever it is to the point where it has to be down pat. And we got to the point where after, you know, it used to take us around 45 minutes to 50 minutes. Now, you know, end of season two, we got it down to literally about 20 minutes. It takes me to apply that. So once I get that on, then I'm kind of free to then go in and get my costume on. And depending on, you know, what I'm wearing that day, I'll either have the full suit or I'll have the suit underneath the track suit in which I have on. And um, that whole process, Wait. I would say, did you just say you wear the full suit underneath your tracksuit? Like, I just, I, I just want to, what? Yeah. 
Yeah. So like, it all depends on, on what we're doing, right? Sometimes there'll be moments where the tracksuit is open a little bit so you can see a little bit of the plate. Mm -hmm. They're very specific. Like our, our creative team is very specific as to what they want. And, and it's great because being uh, playing Vic and him, the choice of him wearing tracksuits also humanizes him. That was a, a big decision of, you know, we want him to feel like uh, a young man. And in order to do that, he, he's not going to be walking around essentially naked the whole time because his cybernetic body is him being naked. And so him wearing those tracksuits over that is, you know, his version of us getting up every morning and putting on clothes. So it depends on what we're going to see. But yeah, sometimes I'm wearing the suit underneath that full tracksuit and other times I'm wearing half the suit when you can just see up to the, up to the chest plate. And, you know, very, very occasionally I'm wearing a suit underneath, which just reveals, you know, what we see with the neck. Um, but yeah, more time I've got the suit and then the tracksuit, which is laid over. But yeah, on, in total, I would say about an hour and a half it takes me to get into full cyborg. Okay, so now I got to ask, one, mm -hmm. is it heavy? And two, does this adjust your already apparent workout regime having <laughs> to deal with the entire cyborg suit? <laughs> Yeah, well, it's it's um, it is it's heavier than you know than it, it might seem. Um, it's manageable. Like the the costume department, LJ, who's amazing, she's done you know from Iron Man to uh, a series of different costumes and um, different creations in the past. But we're in a position where we have a, a phenomenal team behind that, and so uh, the costume it, it's 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 heavy, but it's you know comfortable enough for me to wear it. And also in the position where it allows me to be able to keep my posture, which is, you know, something that helps the character. So I can't really complain in that sense because um, it allows me to actually bring more to the character. And at the same time, it also adjusts my physical ability to be able to perform. Um, but yeah, I, I work specifically on a lot of core because naturally that suit is pulling. And so when it pulls, I have to keep that structure and make sure that my back is strong enough in order to maintain that posture. But overall, I would say, yeah, it's 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 a dream costume, and for what you see and the work that goes behind and what it, what it looks like, it's uh, it, it feels so comfortable to be able to wear. And yeah, hats off to our team because yeah, they nailed it. Word. Okay, so you talked a little bit about the humanness of Vic Stone, and over the last two seasons, we've really seen him develop, right? Like him really develop uh, as a young man, from not really knowing a lot about his past to finding out some memories that were hidden. Let's just, I don't want to spoil anything for anyone who needs mm -hmm. to go watch the season. Um, mm -hmm. But in season two, you've really had this opportunity to really develop out Cyborg in a way that makes him so human. Like this relationship that he has with Elastigirl, you know, the way he's like exploring ways to heal and even, you know, Ronnie Evers. Uh, I, I would be remiss not to talk about Cyborg's ex-boo. Uh -huh. I guess. <laughs> Spoilers. Um, you know, it, and, and this also extends out to kind of what you were talking about, about being naked in the suit, because, you know, we we answered some long speculated questions about uh, Cyborg's anatomy. <clears throat> even season. questions I had. Even questions I had. I, I was, <laughs> you know, okay, you know, reading the breakdown. How is this going to work, Jeremy? Mm. But yeah, sorry. Because <laughs> <laughs> there, there's this moment where Ronnie was like, so, yeah. how is this going to work? Yeah. <laughs> was, was there anything for you that you thought you were particularly proud of or, you know, that you were really happy to see uh, once you got a, ch a chance to see the episodes post-production? Because I, I think what a lot of people don't realize is that there's a, a lot of post that goes into bringing Cyborg to life and, like, even bringing the Doom Patrol to life. Like, they got miniaturized. Mm -hmm. on on a, on a racetrack this season right yeah. you know was there anything you were particularly proud of um in this kind of humanist side of Vic this season yeah um I think that what I was most proud of wasn't actually to do with the the CGI as such and was mainly to do with how we kind of brought across that character. One of the biggest things for me was actually seeing that black love on screen and seeing mm -hmm. these characters able to be in a world where, you know, it's just not, it's just not seen, like it's not represented as much, nearly as much as it should be. And so seeing these two characters and Cyborg being in a position where he falls in love with this woman um, who he can relate to and he can be in a position where it's like, 
hold on a minute, that's what he sees. She's just like me in her own right. And that's what really brought him in and, and, and humanized him even more. And I think, you know, amongst everything that you see, like the uh, the miniatures and things like that, which we have no idea how that's gonna look. We're on set and we have like, we see a giant uh, pan, uh, you know, coming in with a pancake and we're like, okay, I'm real size. And this pan is literally like the size of my house. How I, How is this gonna, gonna work? And seeing how they kind of translate that and all these elements and, you know, the sex ghosts and all of these, different CGI moments where you're like, okay, how are they gonna pull this together is one thing. And seeing every time it's executed to such precision is phenomenal. But yeah, you know, being in a position where this character is humanized to the point where he, he's, he's, he's in love and he sees love and he has this relationship and also th this banter and uh, camaraderie with Ronnie that, you know, transcends and makes you just feel like he's at home. And you then at that point rid everything cybernetic and you literally look at Vic Stone like one of the biggest things that we spoke to the, to, to the team was, okay, this season, I personally want to make Vic Stone the forefront. I almost want to remove Cyborg for a minute and mm -hmm. say, okay, how can people really just attach themselves to Vic, to this young man in which can be related to by anyone, you know? And there are, there is also a world where he relates so heavily to anyone in which, you know, has any disability or anything in which they've gone through in which whether that be the mental the mental health side of things or any physical um disability where now you can relate to that character and feel like oh yeah i'm also a superhero i can be a superhero um and you know those elements in which we are creating and finding with vic stone adhere and allow to all of that so yeah, yeah. no and i really love that because for folks who are like true doom patrol fans from like the comics they will hear ronnie evans and we're like you mean ronald i mean ronnie evers and they'll be like ronald evers and you're like mm -hmm. no 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 this is like a, a different twist it's a different take because ronald evers is his best friend slash yep. turned enemy in the comic books mm -hmm. and then you get this very unique um, still very vulnerable, still friendship, but like this love interest twist to it this mm -hmm. season that I think just develops out Vic in such a way, like no one could have anticipated it. Like we couldn't have anticipated sex ghosts. Like no one knew that, no one thought it coming. <laughs> yeah, what just FYI, we, we are in the same <laughs> shoes as you. Like when you, when you watch <laughs> the episodes and you're like, where did this come from? When we get the scripts, we're in the same, yo, yo send a text. <laughs> yo, Riley, yo, April, Diane, have you seen this? this is you know, so it's like, yeah, it's just as much as a surprise for us as it is for you guys. It's phenomenal. Oh, uh, speaking of the cast. Okay. So this cast is epic, right? Like you've got amazing up and coming, like of all ages actors. Then you've got literal genre legends mm -hmm. um, telling some extremely bizarre, as you just mentioned, uh, stories and really outrageous, like, like, nods to the original comic books as well as you know new twist one what is it like on set and two how do you keep from just laughing the entire time <laughs> first of all we don't we have a great time we laugh a lot we um we as much as it you know everyone's professional so we we take the craft as seriously as as needs but at the same time we want the environment to feel like what you guys see on screen. It's a family in real life, as you see on screen. And, you know, those are my brothers and sisters. I love them dearly. And that allows us to be able to work and have the relationships that we do have on screen. Because chemistry doesn't lie. When you feel that and you see that on screen, you know, great performances have, you know, covered some stuff up. But at the same time, you can't beat real chemistry. And so being on set and, and, and being in these positions, we are given opportunities to also play with things, you know, in terms of we'll get we'll get whatever they need in order to kind of bank, but at the same time, then we get an opportunity where they say, okay, now do something for you. Do, you know, give, give us your version. And that's when we can have that fun. That's when we can, you know, open up and, and say even, okay, well, it, wouldn't it be hilarious if this happened? Or if during that actual take, mm -hmm. something happens, which is open now, which is funny, some of that stuff you, you end up seeing and actually makes the cut, you know? And so it's like, that that relationship that we have with each other allows us to bring out that chemistry and all of these characters we always say that we're a little bit like our characters you know in real life yeah you know, everyone yeah. has their attribute and and at the same time there's a little bit of your character in every character that you play and that is testament to you know the doom patrol and how everyone sits in the relationships and dynamics that we have amongst us um 
constantly butting heads with uh with um robot man so uh <laughs> yeah what, what we see is 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 beautiful it's um you know it's it's a it's a great great cast and great crew and that that allows us to you know create the great work in which we do and i think that's so interesting because i i personally have this theory that robot man is just butting heads because technically you're robotic but you're also human and he's like i can't feel my fingers i yeah. i don't i don't know yeah. um but for real though i do want a steel and stone spinoff like i i need i need that in my life me and you both me and you both <laughs> not like that that for me it was actually my favorite episode of the season surely for that steel and stone experience and as you can see you know it, it worked such a treat that we did it all again in the um the the beekeeper and borg rendition of it so it's like that steel and stone moment like i feel like everyone i got so many tweets from fans saying look we need that spin-off come on hbo max make that spin-off um but yeah it, it was it was an amazing experience and also opportunity for uh, Vic and Cliff to bond in a way that they hadn't bonded before over some real stuff, you know, some real yeah. just kind of life human stuff in which allowed them both to kind of go into this fantasy. And yeah, we enjoyed shooting that um, probably even more than you enjoyed watching it. It was a dream to shoot. And it was like, that is where we do get the opportunity to say, look, no, that don't, this is not serious. This is fun. This is energetic. This yeah. is just, just play. And we get to play and we get to have these, these opportunities. And, um, ideas that pop up or what about you know Cyber being in the shower like we haven't seen that before yeah let's do it what else can we get in this bin yet you know and and that is played out and so i am too hoping for a steel and stone spin-off because yeah it's it's a fan favorite <laughs> so much. um all right so i want to get before we get to some closing questions we got some fan questions mm -hmm. i would be remiss not to actually ask you all right so first up oh larry's trainer <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> if you could have any other character superpowers, what would you choose and why? Any other character um, within the Doom Patrol? I mean, I feel like this is open ended. Maybe you can answer okay. within the Doom Patrol, but then also like, okay, the world's um, your oyster. Within, within the Doom Patrol, I would have to say Crazy Jane. Um, although, although it's a bit of a gift and a curse. I was going to say, also, do you really want all of this? Yes, yes, yes. But, but if you can learn to control it, my thing is, you know, being able, if it, when and if she learns to control that, having the ability to shift and have different, you know, personas, at that point, I could say, yeah, Cyborg living that head. I can still access Cyborg whenever, whenever needed to, but at the same time, the opportunity to access a load of other different characters. So, yeah, Crazy Jane, you know, how powerful she is. She can transform into so many different beings, huge. And then secondly, I would actually say, um, oh, it's a difficult one. I would actually say, uh, oh, maybe I would say Nightcrawler. The, the ability to, to be able to teleport. I just think I relate that to my day-to-day -day life. And, you know, being as busy as I can get, I would love to be able to just teleport to everywhere I wanted to go. I live in LA, but my family and I'm, I'm from London, being able to just go home for dinner with my mom and my family and being like, okay, cool. I'm just got to finish this meeting. But when I get back, I'm going to be at yours. And then, you know, teleport halfway across the world to just have breakfast, lunch or dinner with my family and, you know, spend quality time with them and also see my friends. So yeah, that, that's a real kind of life superhero attribute. And also playing a superhero, it makes you realize that, having uh, abilities like for example cyborg with grid that allows you to have access to the real world it mm -hmm. is very very important when it comes to having a superpower you don't want as a superhero you don't want something that just allows you to crack fine to, to, to fight crime you want something that you can actually have in your day-to-day -day. so nightcrawler and teleportation for me would be the biggest one um yeah yeah all right i i'll give it to you because one kurt is a sweet nice gentle 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 human well yes <laughs> mutant um and i just i just feel like he's just i i love nightcrawler so much you have no no <laughs> um so great answer all right so <laughs> dj stormageddon um also from doctor who i see you stormageddon uh what is more challenging in the role of cyborg being over the top Goofy and comical or vulnerable and more serious? Ooh, that's a very good question. Um, 
I would say the more challenging part for me would be the more the, it would be the comical side. I, I, the mm. reason why I say that is because um, that's the side in which I feel like I have to work harder at. I think naturally when we see Cyborg and the versions and the alliterations of the character, we've kind of seen and we know the serious side. We get the kind of you know vulnerable um, side of things. And naturally as an actor, as a performer, that's that's kind of what I studied in. I, when I went and I studied acting, you know, it was all theater. I was a thespian, I was Shakespeare, et cetera. So that's kind of in my back pocket. But the comedy, I ended up, you know, building out as I started, you know, building my online series, et cetera. But I kind of learned on the job. But when it comes to Cyborg specifically, there is, uh, I have to be very clear and distinct in the moments and trying to have that transcend within the same time being able to still maintain that character. Mm. And so I worked a lot on that, um, you know, this series in those moments and those conversations and those opportunities where, you know, especially with Ronnie and those those playful moments. Um, but yeah, I would say that side is more difficult because I know the pressure in which comes with that. I'm wanting to deliver for the fans to be able to have them enjoy Cyborg in that way. And comedy and, you know, that the 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 2003 rendition, um, Teen Titans, the comedy side of that was what made me fall in love with the character. So I, I would say maybe mm -hmm. I just put my pressure on myself for that. But um, yeah, the comical side, yeah, for sure. But I feel like, like not, not, no slight to like any other show, this show is a masterclass in like toting that line of, Oh no, but the, like being grounded in this very weird, bizarre world, but also mm -hmm. still being funny. And you've mm -hmm. got, again, like so such a hodgepodge of brilliantly talented folks who have been in the industry at different various levels, right? Like mm -hmm. even Brendan Fraser, like Brendan, like people forget Brendan Fraser, like everything he's, he's done no, is yep. comedy. Yeah. Like he is like, yeah. his comedic timing is, um, yeah. if, if you don't know, go watch Be Dazzled. Like it's, like it's, 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 you know, um, que es tu estables. I mean, it's, he's Second to a none. funny dude. Um, <laughs> all right. So K McDermott 2020. Oh, come on. This is a hard question. Uh, favorite scene to film for season two of Doom Patrol. I know I have a favorite that you did, but I'm just going to keep that to myself. Yeah, I, 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 we just spoke about it, but I, I still in stone, guys. Still in stone for me. Like I, it was the most, the the most fun. It was, it was, it was an opportunity for us to come outside of the world of. You know, well, I say come outside of the world of Doom Patrol, but you you don't because it's so wacky and wild in every every sense of the show. But that for my character anyway, being able to really do something weird and wacky. The other guys got to have you know that whole scene um in season one when um, Flex Montalo flexes and everyone else flexes their, you know, private muscles. And I didn't get to be involved in that. So I was like, oh, I wanted to, you know what I mean? Where was I? Um, so yeah, Steel and Stone, I really got to put out my kind of uh, play time with Steel and Stone and, and, and doing that scene with Riley was, was amazing. So yeah, it has to be Steel and Stone. Uh, Steel and Stone is hilarious, but I gotta say uh, y'all being completely high and having your brain oh, sucked yeah. out. <laughs> you're, you're, yes. you're, in, you're in love. Yes. You should get married. <laughs> sure. All right. Okay. Yeah, that 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 rang so high. That rang so high. I, like that whole episode was probably my second favorite episode. Again, opportunity just to the weird and wonderful wacky world where we get to just play and. That I enjoy the most when we get to play. The more we get to play is the most that I'm in my element and I just enjoy because those are the moments that I know the fans are going to love. And so, yeah, I, I put that up there. And for me, still Steel and Stone is so magical. It has to it has to get number one, but that comes very close. Very close. It's so magical. <laughs> um, all right. So it is not a secret. Do Patrol is back for season three. HBO Max. Yes, yes, yes. So excited to see where this is going. What of anything can you actually tell us uh, about where Vic Stone's story is going to be going? Because we ended it with a little bit of heartbreak. I was real. I was like anybody who knew like the whole Ronald ever situation was like waiting for this to break. But like people who weren't like privy to this were kind of I, I feel like people were rooting for Ronnie. Yeah. 100%. Um, 
And Vic, and so like the end was a little bit of a, a heartbreak and it wasn't like it was a private moment for him. Like yeah. he can't forget it. Someone else saw it happen. Um, so what is the next, um, can you tell us anything? And, well, to be honest, we're in a position where where the writer's room are literally going at it as we speak and, and, and are creating. Right. And so often we will get very close to shooting before we end up getting the kind of full breakdown of, you know, this is our character arcs and this is where that character is ascending. So I am none the wiser at this stage, but what I do know is that there is unfinished business. And so we are in a position where yes, you know, there, there are relationships like the Ronnie Evers relationship with Vic and we we didn't get to, we didn't even get to complete, you know, the full series of the 10 episodes, let alone see where we, we ended up with Ronnie and, and Cyborg. And so I'm just looking forward to and seeing and and hearing what the the the, uh, the Room Patrol, as we call our writing team, come up with for um, that transition and that, you know, the rest of the story and what takes place with um, Vic and, and Ronnie. And also where that leaves Vic after, you know, yeah. he hasn't had a time to kind of come down off of that. He's just dealing with one PTSD moment. This another, you know, the guy falls in love for the first time in how long, and then that's just broken down in his trust again. Someone in which he opens up himself to and says, you know, I've had these problems with my father and, you know, I have trust issues, but now I'm gonna open myself up to someone else and then be broken again. Where does that leave Vic? And, 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 and how does that allow him to, you know, deal with that situation at the same time, having his team and, and, and you know, his counterparts trying to become superheroes and you know like um april with elastigirl trying to you know find out how to control and, and be you know a superhero and naturally yeah. she's been coming to vic for this advice and expertise and that's unfinished business too who else will be inspired you know yeah. who knows but hopefully these are some of the things in which we get to explore explore during season three and all of the all of the above i can't wait to to get back into and um dig my teeth into so yeah and I love it because the only thing I can keep thinking about is that Dick's dad was right. They told him not to trust that girl. He just met uh -huh. that girl. Ooh, now uh -huh. he got to deal with the fact that his dad was right about something. Ooh. Yeah, these are conversations <laughs> that I'm looking forward to. <laughs> well, thank you so much. For folks who are out there watching right now who want to see more of your work, who want to keep, you know, keep track of, of what your next projects are, um, can you let us know anything that you got coming up or where people should be watching out for you uh, in the future? 100%. Um, I would say, guys, just to, to stay tapped in by my social media, which is where all my updates come. I'm, I'm a huge head on Instagram and also love Twitter. Um, and I just recently launched the YouTube channel in which, you know, I'm going to be updating and, you know, more vlog content and doing vlogs and lifestyle content. Um, I have a bunch of videos for actors and uh, motivational videos for the everyday person currently. Um, taking that kind of superheroism that I get from Vic and trying to do my part in saving the world as Javan Wade. Um, so yeah, keep an update on those socials. And I have a bunch of projects I'm developing with my production company in London and my multimedia company, The Wall Group, and films in which I'm actually writing myself and and looking to star in. I'm, I'm about to get off the ground. So yeah, can't wait to, to share more with you guys, but definitely keep locked in via social media. Follow me, hit me up. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to continuing this journey with you guys. That is dope. Uh, I have watched those videos. You should go check it out. Uh, I am ex Thank so you. excited for folks to actually get your autograph. And like, I'm so excited for folks to like be able to do more interaction with you online because uh, yeah. this is just, I mean, it, it's not the beginning for you, but it is definitely just the beginning. So um, thank you for being with us today, folks. Uh, this has been Ace Universe. I'm Anjali Groshe. Uh, they let me host sometime and have dope conversations. <laughs> You've been like amazing, this. I must say. So thank you for your thank expertise you. and, and your warm spirit. It's been amazing. Thank you. Thank you. All right, folks, make sure you're tuning in. More stuff coming.